Hi, thank you for joining us today. This is Dina at Remnant Nation Radio and NewWinePouring.com. Welcome to Remnant Nation Radio and NewWinePouring.com. Remnant Nation Radio is a prophetic and poetic view of the sojourning bride of Christ in the world today. Hi, we're at the Remnant Nation channel today with this new episode. But before we get into the podcast, I want to read a couple of passages to you out of 1 Corinthians 14 and Isaiah 28. These two passages have been connected by Paul when he's speaking to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 14. So let's go ahead and start reading. Verse 18, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than ten thousand words in a tongue. Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips I will speak to this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, says the Lord. Therefore tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Now let's go to Isaiah 28. In Isaiah 28, verse 9, it says, Whom will he teach knowledge, and whom will he make to understand the message? Those just weaned from milk, those just drawn from the breast. Verse 11, For with stammering lips... And another tongue he will speak to his people, to whom he said, This is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Now does that sound familiar? This is what Paul was quoting. He said that the tongues is for a sign. And so this is what Isaiah was saying, that he was going to give the stammering lips and the unknown tongue as a sign. And that that would be their refreshing. That would be their rest. Yet they would not. So what he's saying there is even though he gives the tongues as a sign. And that was was what the Jews saw in the day of Pentecost. That was a sign unto them. And this gift of tongues continues to be a sign. But it's also for refreshing and for the rest. And so whenever you're seeking to have refreshing and to be rested, this is where you get it. Paul was teaching the Corinthians that this new sign, this gift that they were given, has its order. And they had been using it out of order because they were so enamored by the gift of tongues. Why? Because it was a supernatural sign from heaven. That's why they were over elated with it. In so much that rather than speaking in a language people knew, whenever the church doors opened, they were all speaking in tongues. They were so enamored by this gift that everybody was speaking in tongues. And to them, it was more important because it was such a sign. It was even more important than prophesying. But Paul wanted them to understand prophesying is more important because people can understand what you're saying. They can benefit from it. That tongues is for the edifying of yourself, of your spirit. And that's where the refreshing comes in. That's where the rest comes in. And we're supposed to have it. And we're supposed to do it. Okay? So, Paul was not diminishing tongues. He was just trying to explain to them that it it was for a sign. But that we need a sign because of our doubt and unbelief. And so, don't exalt it higher than what it should be. Because if things were perfect, we wouldn't have it at all. We wouldn't need it at all. But because we have hardness of heart. Because we have doubt and unbelief, God has given us the sign. But that does not diminish it. We're given this tool as a sign to the Jews and also to refresh and to be our rest. And so anyone that knows anything about speaking in tongues, anyone that has that gift that everyone should have, and we'll go into that in just a minute, 
because it's the least of all the gifts. Okay, we'll go into that, and you'll see in the scripture. If you bear with me, you're going to see why you should be speaking in tongues. We have that because he wants us to enter into his rest, and he wants us to be refreshed. Amen. So let's continue in the podcast and find out more about this incredible gift of tongues. Hi, thank you for joining me today. This is Dina, and I am with NewWinePouring.com with one W. If you want to find my podcast, you can go to iHeartRadio, and it's called The Remnant Nation. We call it The Remnant Nation Radio. This is an off-the-cuff podcast, meaning that I just grabbed my smartphone. I want to share with you how important it is to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. John said, John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water. But there's one that comes after me. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So after the water baptism, known as John's baptism, there was a spirit fire baptism. And when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ, we do get a measure of the Holy Spirit. When we say yes to God and we give our life to him, we get a measure of the Holy Spirit. But there's more than that. There's a baptism. Now, if you know what water baptism is, you know that you get immersed in the water, you come back up, and you're soaking wet. Well, the fire baptism, the spirit baptism with fire, is like the same thing, but it's a spiritual baptism. And so what happens is is you accept the Lord Jesus Christ, you say yes to Him, and then you begin to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit, okay? Jesus told his disciples, and everyone that was around him that witnessed when he ascended into heaven, Jesus told them to go into Jerusalem and to wait until they became endued with power from on high. So there was an event that was supposed to take place. Now Jesus had also said before that encounter, before he left them, he said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He said, these signs will follow them that believe in my name. They will cast out devils. They will speak with new tongues. They will lay hands on the sick. They shall recover. And if they take up any deadly thing, it shall in no way hurt them. So that was called the Great Commission. But what he wanted them to do before they went out and made disciples of all nations, he wanted them to go and gather until they became endued with power from on high. And so that is when, in the second chapter of Acts, that is when they were all gathered together during the time of Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost. They were all gathered together, and they had been waiting on the Lord. They had been leaning into Him. They had been seeking, the people call it tearing in the Lord. They were waiting for this thing called the endowment with power from on high. And so the Bible says that during that time, a a rushing, mighty wind came into the place where they had gathered. They had come together in unity. They had come in one mind, in one accord. And then a rushing, mighty wind came through. And all that fell upon each one of them over their heads was what they called tongues of fire. Licks of fire manifested over their head, and that's when they became baptized in the Holy Ghost and with fire. And when this happened, it says they all began to speak in an unknown tongue. They all began to speak in tongues, every last one of them. That is why, till this day, many preach and many believe, including myself, That when you get baptized by the Holy Spirit, one of the manifestations of that baptism of Holy Ghost and fire is speaking in other tongues. Because everyone, they all receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't say to one, you can have this, and to another, uh, you don't get that. So when they came together, they all received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They all received the baptism and began to speak in other tongues. So all who come to him that get the baptism of the Holy Spirit will manifest the speaking in other tongues. This is our basic prayer language. The scripture says to pray in the Spirit and pray with your understanding also. 
The scripture says that you can build up your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, the, the thing about this is, is that God wants us all to build up our most holy faith. He is not a God of favoritism. He does not allow one person to grow in a measure of faith and then not give another person the tools that they need to grow in their measure of faith. Everyone has equal access. God is an equal opportunity God. As much as you press into Him, whatever measure you meet to receive from Him, He is going to match that back. You see, he is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't have favorites. The only difference between those that have and those that have not are those that will not. Those that will not are the only ones that are different from the haves. And so we need to be hungry for the things of God. We need to be thirsty for the things of God. We need to press into the things of God. And when we do that, we get filled. We get healed. But we've got to press in. We've got to be hungry. When you're hungry, nothing will satisfy you but food. Nothing will satisfy you but food. Going out and buying new clothes when you're hungry isn't going to satisfy you. Only food is going to satisfy you when you're hungry. When you're thirsty, and I mean really thirsty, nobody wants a can of soda. That just adds to the thirst. When you're thirsty, you want water to drink. And Jesus is the water of life. He said that he that drinks of me will never thirst again. And so we have equal access to him who press into him. And he says, you have not because you ask not. He said, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. So... Again, God is no respecter of persons. He will freely give. So he expects us to share everything that he has given us. You can build up your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Ghost. That tells me, because he is no respecter of persons, and those that seek him find him, and those that ask receive him, that everyone has access to this tool to pray in the Holy Ghost ghost to get their most holy faith built up also when you go through Acts you can look at even Acts the 19th chapter and study that where you see that Paul ran into a whole bunch of disciples that were in John's baptism he asked them have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed and they said, well, we haven't even heard there was anything such as the Holy Spirit since we believed. And so then he baptized them in the Holy Ghost and with fire. How he did that was he laid hands on them. This is how you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this is how you get the baptism of fire is by the laying on of hands. And so Paul, the apostle, laid hands on them and they received the way that they knew, how we knew in the scriptures that they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit is because they all began to speak in tongues. And so if you are one of those that have been told that you have received uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit when you got saved, then you need to go back to the scriptures. Because when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you will know it. There is no question, there will be no question in your mind, you will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you've been baptized, you've been endued with power from on high. Because it changes you. You become a bolder witness. The joy of the Lord, because the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, one of the manifestations, one of the nine fruits of the Spirit, and a fruit is a product of whatever tree or vine it comes from, the fruits are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness, long-suffering, and self-control. And so when you are full of the Holy Spirit, these fruits really come forth, especially uh, the fruit of joy and the fruit of peace. But also you get boldness. And there's an account in the scriptures and Acts where the church came together because Peter and John got thrown into jail and there was some persecution that broke out. 
for their uh, confession of faith and their witness for Christ. And so they all gathered together and they began to pray that there would be a bold witness for God. So what happened was that they became baptized, immersed in the power and the presence of God. They became immersed in the Holy Spirit again. Another baptism, and it was called the baptism of boldness. And so a supernatural boldness came upon them when they received this baptism. And then they began to go and continue to turn the world upside down. They became scattered because of the persecution, uh, but they continued to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ without any more fear. And so when you follow the Acts of the Saints in the scripture, over and over again, whenever you see the baptism of the Holy Spirit taking place, you have this one manifestation of speaking in tongues. Now, speaking in tongues is a little bit different than the ministry gift of tongues and interpretation. Everyone receives the, the initial gift of uh, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, everybody gets their prayer language. Now, some people, they're going to have a real, you know, fluent prayer language. Others may just have a few words. Uh, and whatever it is that you get, you just exercise that little bit, uh, no matter what measure it is. But as you exercise it, then it will become more and more. A lot of times people get baptized in the Holy Spirit and they get their tongue, but then they don't continue it once they leave the assembly that they were in when they got that uh, gift. But you can take it home with you. You can actually go home and get prayed for, go home and seek it again and even get more uh, of an encounter with God that gives you a stronger tongue that you can pray. So this is the refreshing. The tongues is a refreshing. The scripture says the tongues is causes refreshing. It refreshes your soul. So once again, God is no respecter of persons. He's not going to give you a tool that's going to build your most holy faith, but not give it to others. A tool for refreshing, but not give it to others. And the problem is, you, you might ask, well, we go to a spirit-filled church and half the people speak in tongues and half of them don't, or maybe only a half handful of people speak in tongues and the rest don't. And the reason why this is, is because of a false teaching that you get the Holy Spirit when you receive Jesus. Or that when you get laid hands on and you're prayed for, that you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but you don't necessarily uh, have to get the tongue. And the problem with that is, then people will not tarry and wait and press in until they get their tongue, until they get their prayer language. They just go and they, they're told, go sit down and just believe God, because we prayed and you're just receiving it by faith. Well, what happened when they were assembled together on the day of Pentecost and they got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Peter stood up because they actually drew a large crowd. A large crowd wanted to know what was going on because something was going on. They saw something. They heard something. There was a ruckus. They said, I think these people are, are full of wine. They're drunk. And it's only, you know early in the morning, so they must have been partying all night. They want That's what their explanation was. This is what's going on. And Peter stood up and he said, look, these all here that you see are not those that are uh, drunk. They are not. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. He said, what you're seeing here, he says, what you see and hear is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And so we can find this, the second chapter of Joel. Peter said, This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the end times, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Young men will have visions and old men will dream dreams. The Spirit of God in the end times, and it happened 2,000 years ago. The end times began 2,000 years ago. Peter earmarked when the end times began by saying, 
This is that spoken by Joel who said, in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit. And so for 2,000 years, Lord God has been pouring out his spirit upon all flesh, all who will come to him, all who will press into him, all that want more of him. And you know, isn't it interesting that there are a lot of people, now get this, get this, because there's a lie that's been spreading in the church. And they'll say, oh, well, you got up and you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. People prayed for you. Well, you know, sometimes these people that are praying for you, they don't even have the baptism of the Holy Spirit themselves. And so don't just let anyone lay hands on you. Make sure that they're full of the Holy Spirit. Because you're not going to get anything from them if they don't even have it. If they don't have the gift of healing, you're not going to receive healing. If they don't have faith to believe for your healing, you're not going to receive anything. Uh, Without faith, we cannot please God. So, you know, we need to seek out people that are full of God, full of the power of God, full of faith. That those fruits are manifesting in their lives. The gifts of the Spirit, okay? Uh, What are some of the gifts of the Spirit? That that you speak in tongues. Uh, Gifts of of the Spirit is that that you prophesy. The gifts of the Spirit is you have a supernatural ability to discern between spirits. Uh, You have gifts of healing. That when you pray for people, people get healed. Workings of miracles. Supernatural things happen around people that have the gift of working of miracles. Praise God. So the power of God is evident in their life. So this is the thing. This is where it's amazing that the enemy can pull the wool over people's eyes. Because he doesn't want you to be full of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't want you to be baptized in the Holy Ghost and with fire. The fire is what refines us. A zeal of God that burns inside of us. A fire that cannot be quenched. This is that baptism I'm talking about. It changes you. It turns a lamb into a lion. You will know that you are baptized in the Holy Ghost. You know, you will know that you're endued with power from on high if you have had that encounter. So if you question that at all, then it's safe to say that you probably do not have that. It's safe to say that you need more. And it's okay to get prayed for again. But this time when you get prayed for, get prayed for by someone uh, and has the gifts of the Spirit manifesting in their life. Because like I said, you cannot give nothing if you don't have it. Such as I have, I give. That's what Peter said. Peter said to the man at the gate, everybody knew this person. That whole thing that happened strategically arranged by God. That this individual that everybody knew that was unable to walk, and he was a beggar, and he was begging. Peter, Peter came by him, and he was looking. They looked down at him, and he looked up at them, and Peter said, Silver and gold I have none, but such as I have, I give it to you. And when he gave it, he stood up by the power of God, by the dunamis power of God, which the word miracle means, uh, the, the word miracle in the Greek is called dunamis, okay? So by the dunamis power of God, a miracle working power, this man stood up. And so the name of Jesus was glorified, and many more believed upon that name. So Peter said, such as I have, I give to you. And so we can't give what we don't have. If we're full of the Holy Ghost, then we give the Holy Spirit. If we're full of faith and we pray for people, then God can grant them the gift of faith. We can give what we have. Glory be to the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus. So if you look at the pattern of doubt and unbelief, if you'll see how the lie works, isn't it interesting That those people who are told that they've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but they don't have the evidence of speaking in tongues. But they're told, don't worry about it, you got it. Okay? Isn't it interesting that those people are none the better? That they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but 
something really hasn't changed about them. They don't really seem to be any different than they were the day before. They don't really have a change in their boldness or their countenance. They don't begin to prophesy. They might have a sort of a feel-good anointing that was passed on to them, even maybe a feel-good blessing uh, that has given them a day of peace or two or three days of peace, but they don't have that sustaining encounter with God that changes them because out of their belly, out of their belly is coming forth rivers of living water. Because the scripture says that when we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. You, my friend, when you receive Christ, you become a never-ending supply when you get baptized in the Holy Ghost and with fire. You are an asset to the kingdom of God. Because people can come to you. And even though you don't have anything in and of yourself, you can reach in to that well because you've had that thing opened up to you because you had that encounter of being baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Glory be to God. Thank you, Jesus. So isn't it interesting that these people that are told that they didn't receive the Holy Spirit or they did receive the Holy Spirit, And that they did get baptized, even though nothing seemed to happen and nothing seemed to change. But they're just to walk away and and don't, you know, ever have to ask again because you're just receiving it by faith. But there's no evidence. No one sees any difference. You don't feel any different. You didn't get any kind of prayer language, right? Isn't it interesting that you don't begin to prophesy? That's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And so that is evidence. See, there has to be evidence that comes from your life. If you seek truth, he he will begin to show it to you. But when you are baptized in the Holy Ghost and you have received your prayer language, because the scripture says we don't know how to pray as we ought to pray. And the scripture says that we need to pray in the spirit and pray with our understanding also. And we need to sing in the Spirit and sing with our understanding also. Okay, the Scripture all says that, right? And again, those are tools to build ourselves up, okay, from the inner man and the inner man. The Bible says that when we pray in the Spirit, our mind is unfruitful, but our spirit man is strengthened in faith. We have these tools, to sustain us. It's his sustaining grace, the gifts that he's given us, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So, he's no respect for persons. He's not going to give a a tool for refreshing, but not give it to everyone who seeks. He's not going to fill us full of his Holy Spirit and give us a prayer language, but not everyone gets to have that. He's not going to tease some of us and satisfy others. All are blessed that come to him. All who seek him will find him. All who ask of him will receive. Glory be to God. All who knock on the door shall have that door open to them. And when he was talking about the Holy Spirit, when he said that when you ask of me, I will not give you a stone, I'll not give you a serpent. I will give you the Holy Spirit to all of them that ask. The Comforter isn't out there to go find. He's in us. The source is in you. So, if you've ever had anyone ever tell you that, oh, you don't need the baptism of the Holy Spirit because you already have it when you accepted Jesus, or you don't need to have the manifestation of uh, speaking in tongues, and, you know, not everybody has it. Not everybody has the, the tongues. Now, you might think about the scripture where, where Paul, in 1 Corinthians, at the end of 1 Corinthians 12, he says, there's a scripture that says, do all prophesy, are all apostles, are all prophets, right? But the way that that's been taught has been an error, If in context, he's saying, just like this, you know, we've got an orange here. Does everybody have an orange? Does everybody have all these things? We have all these, this provision here. We have a whole crate of of steaks right here. Does everybody have all that? 
There's no answer. It's a rhetorical question. Or it's not a rhetorical question, however that goes. <laughs> anyway, he's just throwing that out there. Why? Because what he says in the next sentence, he says, but earnestly, earnestly desire the better gifts, the greater gifts. So think about this. He's talking about gifts. He's talking about access to all of these gifts. He's saying earnestly desire spiritual gifts. He's saying, does everybody have everything that, that is available to him right here out of all these crates? Why are you walking out the door with just a bag of potato chips when you can have some oranges, some apples? He's saying, does everybody have everything that's here? Did you fill up your grocery bag? Well, if not, desire, covet, want the greater gifts. Desire them. It's okay. It's okay. You, you don't have to just settle for potato chips. You can have this roast right here. This crate. Come and get some roast out of this crate. Earnestly desire, covet the greater gifts. Press into them. Press into them. Don't let them drop a seed on the inside of you that's really not a seed of faith, but it is a seed of doubt and unbelief, telling you that, oh, you, yeah, you, we laid hands on you. You received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, there's no manifestation. There's no power because that's all I walk in is a, just a feel-good blessing because I don't even have the baptism of the Holy Spirit myself. And, you know, people, yeah, they come up and get that kind of feel-good blessing because God's a loving, merciful God. And, you know, he'll give us what we'll receive and believe for. And if we receive and believe for a blessing, he'll give it because he's a loving God. He wants to fill up your grocery bag. He wants to fill up your grocery bag. Praise God. But he's saying, Paul's saying, you know, go find a bigger grocery bag. Don't just cup your hands and take a little bit. It's all available to you. Covet, earnestly desire the greater gifts. So if he wasn't speaking to the tongue talkers, because speaking in tongues is the least of all the gifts. They, they are the least of all the gifts. Now think about it. Why would he say that? Why would he say that if there was not even tongues that people had? Why would he say, earnestly desire the greater gifts? The greater gifts. That means you've got a gift, but you don't got the greater gift. Earnestly desire it. Seek after it. Go after it. God wants to bless you. He wants to use you. He wants to endue you with power from on high. And he's speaking to those that are endowed with power from on high. Because they received something from him. Some kind of manifestation. You know, basically he was saying, you're not all apostles. So he was kind of being, I guess, maybe facetious or something. Are all apostles? No, you're not all apostles. Are all prophets? No, you're not all prophets. You're not all pastors. You're not all teachers. So come back through here and receive, press in, earnestly covet, desire spiritual gifts. Greater, the greater ones. Praise God. Because in that passage, uh, Paul puts them in order. He said, first there is apostles. Second, okay, second in line, in importance, or however you want to say it, are a prophets. And third are teachers. And then workings of miracles. And so he starts going down you know, I hate to say a pecking order, but he kind of starts going down uh, the list on the bottom, getting down to the bottom of what are the least of the gifts. The ministry gift of tongues. Not the prayer language, tongues that people received, that they, when they pray in their most holy faith, that they get built up in. If you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire, you've already received your prayer language. That has nothing to do with the ministry gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues. 
And if you look at it, it's, its importance, it's up there. When you look at that passage, it's right up there in the same paragraph with, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, Do all, are all workers of miracles, are all, you know, operating in the gifts of healing. And so, tongues and interpretation of tongues is the ministry gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues. It's the public gift. The gift where you come out, you say a tongue, you speak an unknown language out loud. Everybody hears it. The one where when they hear that tongue go forth, they need to quiet themselves down and wait for interpretation. That's the least of all the gifts. And if you don't get that right in church, you're not going to get nothing right. And if you have a body of believers and very few of them are really endued with power from on high, then what are you doing? Because you're supposed to be equipping the saints. You're supposed to be equipping the saints. So whoever you are or whatever you are that is standing behind that pulpit, if you're not equipping the saints, I don't even want to know what you are. I pray that God will rescue everyone that is in your congregation, that you are leading to deadness. You are not taking them anywhere. You want to know why your people are broken? That your people, that they're, they're raising children that go out into the world? You want to know why they're sick and dying? Because you're not doing what you're supposed to do. You set up shop and you called yourself a pastor. You set up shop, you called yourself a pastor. And they came in. They walked in. They came in. And because you called yourself a pastor, they trusted you. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you are. But if you're not equipping the saints, then you are an imposter. Because... Those that are called by God, those that are anointed by God, the apostles, the prophets, the teachers, the evangelists, the pastors, the shepherds, the elders, the deacons, hey, thank you, Jesus, they care for the sheep. They love the sheep. They care for the sheep. They take care of the sheep. They equip the saints. They get them ready. They put them through an exercise program to be able to make it through the winter. They make sure they have everything they need to be able to bear fruit in their lives, to to make more sheep. What is happening to a lot of congregations, they're dying off and disappearing slowly. The diehards... They're still pushing through, pressing through. Every once in a while, they'll put that revival over here sign up on their building. And they'll get more in. They'll get some more in. They might add a few families because there was this little game play, this, this play that, that uh, was put on. An appearance like the clouds that look like they're full of rain, an appearance of a rain cloud coming in. They put on an appearance that looked like something good was about to pour out for thirsty, dry, drought-stricken souls. And they all gathered, and a few of them were pulled into what they thought were a fold that passed and and they're still waiting because they got caught up in another one of those places that has a form of godliness but denies the power thereof there are clouds without rain oh Woe unto the shepherds. Woe unto the shepherds who scatter the sheep. You know, you can scatter the sheep and then draw them unto yourself and uh, corner them to serve your own interest. 
because you want their hooves, you want their fleece, you want their wool, you want their meat. And you feed off of them for a while. You shave their wool, you shave their wool, they bring in their money, they bring in their tithe, you've got a living going on. And then when they become maybe not so useful for you, or they want more, because they feel like somehow they're missing God, and they're not doing everything that they feel in their heart they should be or could be doing, then that spirit, that thing, that demon that has control of that institution, uh, it knows when the sheep are wanting more. And, you know, they're starting to get bold. And they start to, there's an authority that starts to happen. Things aren't right here. Things aren't quite right. This ain't quite right. And when that happens, see, they start breaking their legs. They start taking them out for everything that they're worth. The Word of God calls it the Ahab, Jezebel, modus operandi. That spirit goes after their vineyard. It goes after their money. It goes after their bank account. And they'll take them for everything that they're worth. Because, see, now they want to begin to minister. Now they want to begin. Now they begin to feel like, well, wait a minute. I know a lot of the Word of God. I should, I should be doing something more than I'm doing right now. Oh, well, we'll put you through a training program. We'll get you ready for deaconship. We'll, we'll put you through our, our, uh, our deacon classes, deacon and deaconess classes. We'll start getting you involved in our evangelist program. All you need to do is buy a syllabus and, uh, you know, we'll start getting you going. And this goes on and on and on and on. By the time it's over, you've got a skinned, bunch of sheep all you've got is a pile of hooves and fleeces and ears and tails left to what was once potential to what was once a destiny to what was once a purpose of God so Come out from among her, my people. Come out from among her. Come out from among her, my people, lest you suffer in her judgments. Because when this thing is over, God is going to deal with what God is going to deal with. And all of the destinies that have been lost, all of the purposes that have been aborted, through this religious system, God is going to put his finger on And he is going to light a fire. And that fire, he said, Jesus looked at what he looked at that time when he said that I come to bring a fire. And I wished, I would, that that fire was already kindled. Well, there is a fire coming. There is a day coming. And everyone that's listening to this podcast right now, and the Spirit of God is convicting you, you have created this huge business, whatever it is, but it's been a cloud without rain. It's had so much promise year after year after year, season after season after season. And you've had all those people coming. And then they, you have all of these people going. And it's been a revolving door, a revolving door. And... It's the first church of the revolving door. And you blamed it on the sheep. And every group that went came in, you embraced. But when they, they went out, you kicked them on the behind as they were going out. 
You called them false prophets. You called them heretics. You called them troublemakers, di dividers. You ruined reputations. And he didn't think twice about it. They were the problem. You were not the problem. You need to repent. You need to cry out to God. You need to dis disband. You need to become what God has ordained the church to become. You need to be what he ordained you to be. You need to do it like he wants you to do it. Not how you've seen it done. Not how you think it should be. Not like how every denomination in this country has pooped out establishments to become just like they are. Monuments of a of a move of God that once was, but now is gone, long gone. And you've caused people to camp out at your monument when the church is a living, breathing organism. You've turned it into an organization. Merciful God. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I pray that everybody that's listening right now, that, Lord, you'll cut them to their heart if they are one of these hirelings. If they are one of these, Father, that has been a robber of destinies, that has been used by the enemy to create abortions, spiritual abortions, separating people from their potential, separating them from their God-given potential and their destiny and their call. Father, Lord, if there's anything left in them that they can step out of this, that they can get out of this, then I pray, Lord, that you have mercy and you do it. Lord, help them, deliver them, set them free. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, thank you for tuning in. And if this is ministered to you, make sure you share it with everyone you know. And God bless.